Across the Channel, France had already begun to establish her own independent deterrent. Just two years after the first Valiant sent its service, plans were underway for a bomber to equip her force to throw, whose operations would closely match those of the V-Force. The requirement was just as challenging, as unlike Britain's V-Force, France's airborne nuclear delivery system would be supersonic. Dassault was chosen to build the aircraft to be known as the Mirage 4. When the first of four prototypes was rolled out, it was seen that the design was essentially a scaled-up version of the single-seat Mirage 3 Delta Wing Fighter, albeit some 50% larger and with twice the wing area thrust and weight. The Mirage 4 first took to the air in June 1959. In spite of its size, the performance was outstanding. A top speed of Mach 2.2 closely matched that of the fighter. The Mirage 4 became operational with the Force the Frap in 1964. Now all three of the wartime allied big powers possessed the ultimate weapon of destruction. In Britain, the new decade of the 1960s brought improved versions of the V-bomber. The stopgap Valiant was not considered for further improvement, but both Vulcan and Victor were extensively modified. The Vulcan B Mark II introduced a new large span wing, together with upgraded Olympus jets and a comprehensive ECM equipment fit. The new wing, with a dramatic double kink leading edge, greatly improved high altitude performance, as well as extending range by 50%. The Victor B Mark II introduced Conway turbofans, with twice the power of the BI Sapphire turbojets. Coupled with a slightly longer wingspan, these also improved high altitude performance and range. The reaction time of the V-Force was constantly honed and improved. From 1962, the RAF practice of dispersing its V-Force changed to QRA, Quick Reaction Alert. Once alerted, flights of four V-bombers were dispersed to the secondary airfields, where special hard standings, complete with electrical supplies and minimal crew comforts, had been constructed by the runway's edge. Each squadron was tasked with having one aircraft at 15 minutes readiness throughout the year. But this was not enough against a surprise nuclear attack. The QRA system allowed each squadron to maintain four aircraft, four and later two minutes readiness. On receiving the order to scramble, the crews aimed to be able in less than four minutes. Upon reaching the aircraft, the first priority was to get the engine started. The SIM start system, introduced on Mark II Vulcans, brought all four engines to life simultaneously, a greatly reduced response time. Within just 35 seconds of engine start, Vulcans could begin to taxi, whilst the Bloodhound SAMs protecting the main bases prepared to take on any incoming rate. From a standing start, the Vulcan could reach an altitude of 1,500 meters in just one minute. And climb to over 12,000 meters in just 10 minutes. Each crew knew its destination as soon as it joined the squadron. Since 1958, Bomber Command and SAC had adopted an integrated bombing plan. The grand strategy was beyond the knowledge of those at squadron level, but it certainly appeared that the RAF's role in an all-out nuclear exchange was to clear a way into the heart of the USSR for SAC bombers. After takeoff, the crew flew with flash curtains fully zipped up. The entire pre-planned route was flown by radar and instruments alone.
widespread introduction of the Mark II Victors and Vulcans released the Valiant for other duties. Among the most important was in-flight refueling. Valiants became full-time tankers in April 1962, and their main customers were fighters and attack aircraft. In regard to the rest of the V-Force, the tanker Valiants were there to permit global deployment at short notice. end of 1962, the V-Force was at its zenith, having achieved its intended maximum strength of 144 bombers. Victors were in service with six squadrons at Cottesmore, Marham and Whiten. There were nine Vulcan squadrons operated by three wings at Scampton, Waddington and Collins Bay. change in operating procedures was now being developed as the Soviet air defences increased in effectiveness. The shooting down of an American U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft over Svedlovsk in 1960 has been regarded as signalling the end of the V-bomber's effectiveness, but that was not the case. The U-2 had flown to the heart of the USSR without the benefit of offensive jamming and without a hundred or so companions to help confuse the enemy. Bomber Command remained happy that it could still mount an effective mission at high levels, but nevertheless made preparations to meet the prospect of more effective Soviet defence. Low-level operations offered the best way of undetected penetration. Ground hugging was to give a new lease of operational life to the V-Force. But from a fatigue point of view, low altitude flying imposed greater stress on the airframe. Devoid of any self-defensive equipment apart from chaff, the Valiant Force was the first to be retasked for low-level tactical operations. Training proceeded normally until late 1964, when the entire Valiant fleet was found to have chronic wing fatigue. All were quickly withdrawn from service. Vulcans and Victors began low-level training in 1963. Changes in weaponry were also needed to keep the deterrent effective, so that during the 1960s, three methods of delivery were employed. Mark I versions of the Vulcan and Victor had progressed to an improved version of the Yellow Sun 3-4 bomb, which required them to make a pop-up manoeuvre to release the weapon from medium altitude over the target. Two Vulcans at Coningsby and Victors at Cottesmore were issued with the new British designed 3 4 bomb, the WE 177. This was a laydown weapon intended for low level release. Completing the trio was the Avro Blue Steel, a rocket powered short range nuclear missile with its own navigation system. Powered by highly volatile fuel, Blue Steel proved to be notoriously difficult to integrate under both Vulcan and Victor. Modifications had to be made to the bomb bays and avionics to accommodate the weapon. But at long last, there was no need for the bomb to approach heavily defended areas. Blue Steel could be released from 185 kilometers away and climbed to 21,000 metres 
before diving onto its target at Mark 1.8 and detonating a one megaton warhead. The weapon had to have a folding tail fin to reduce the reduced ground clearance of the Victor's low undercarriage, and refueling it proved to be one of the most potentially hazardous occupations in the RAF. Avro built 57 production blue steel missiles, which were shared among five V-bomber units. The weapon became operational in late 1962, equipping two Victor squadrons, numbers 100 and 139 at Wittering, as well as three squadrons of the Vulcan Wing at Scampton. These were numbers 27, 83 and 617, the famed Dam Masters. From mid-1964, Blue Steel was modified for low-level launch to match the new operational profile, although this imposed a severe penalty by cutting range to a quarter of that at high level. An improved version of Blue Steel was cancelled in favour of an American weapon. The Douglas Skybolt was an air-launched ballistic missile with a range of 1,600 kilometres. Unfortunately for the RAF, the US government cancelled the Skybolt program in late 1962. Britain was subsequently forced to buy Polaris submarine-launched missiles to maintain its independent deterrent. At a stroke, the raison d'etre of the V-Force was removed. However, until Polaris entered service, the 144 V-Force bombers continued to form Britain's sole strategic nuclear deterrent, and they practiced this role throughout the 1960s. Coincidentally, the switch to low-level operations came a coat of grey and green camouflage. Lone Ranger overseas deployments continued, as well as conventional power projection missions, as occurred during the British confrontation with Indonesia. With a 16-ton conventional bomb load, the Victor was particularly well suited for this role. Victors and Vulcans were dispatched to the Far East as a reminder of British air power. Indonesia backed down. In 1966, the launch of the first of Britain's four Polaris-carrying submarines heralded the run of the V-Force. Operational controls were conducted two years later. On the 30th of June, 1969, the Royal Navy resumed its historic role as Britain's first line of strategic defence. At midnight, the RAF's Vulcans ended QRA. The era of the V-bombers as Britain's nuclear guardians had ended. Victor and Vulcan squadrons disbanded or were converted to other duties, such as in-flight refueling or strategic reconnaissance. Since the retirement of the Valiant, Victors became the RAF's sole tanker assets. They carried out this important role for 30 years. One squadron of Vulcans was retasked with long-range maritime radar reconnaissance. The Vulcans expanded their conventional bombing role, but also continued to carry WE-177s. Based in Britain and Cyprus, they had two main roles. NATO theatre nuclear strike in support of British national interests. A tactical form of WE-177 is now carried by the Vulcan successor, the Panavia Tornado Interdictor strike aircraft. Unlike the V-Bombers, the development of other strategic nuclear delivery systems did not affect the Mirage 4 as drastically. By 1976, France had completed her nuclear triad with the deployment of both submarine and land-launched ballistic missiles. But Mirage 4 still formed an integral component of the Force de Dissuasion, carrying a 65 AM-22 lay-down weapon.
A standoff weapon finally arrived in 1980, when 18 Mirage 4s were converted to IVP standard to carry the ASMP missile. They also acquired a new Antelope 5 ground mapping radar and modern navigational attack systems. The IVD ASMP combination entered service in 1985. Over 30 years of Mirage 4 operations came to an end in 1996. It had been augmented and then fully replaced in the nuclear strike role by its successor, the Mirage 2000 m Based on the combat trainer variant of the Mirage 2000 fighter, this two-seat aircraft will take France's strategic nuclear forces into the 21st century. The Paloma computerized mission planning system is a far cry from the firmly low-tech method of mission planning employed by the forebears of this aircrew. Digitized maps allow the crew to plan a route, taking into account the latest threat reports. This information is then fed directly into the aircraft's onboard navigation and attack system. Like the Mirage 4, the 2000N has a crew of two, a pilot in front and a weapon system officer in the rear. ASMP, Air Son Moyen Porte, delivers a 300 kiloton warhead at a top speed of Mach 2. It has a range of 250 kilometers when launched at high altitude or 80 kilometers at low altitude. The end of the Cold War has brought about a relaxation in the defence posture of both independent nuclear deterrents. In Britain, RAF tornadoes remain wired to carry an upgraded form of the WE-177 weapons. The Armée de l'Air has two 2000M versions in service, the NK-1, tasked solely with nuclear strike, and NK-2, tasked with conventional strike but able to carry ASAP. Although this change means that the British and French nuclear strike aircraft are no longer placed on high alert, they remain ready to attack at very short notice with the ultimate weapons of destruction. Throughout the Cold War, Britain and France's independent nuclear deterrents symbolized their status as global powers. In view of the mightiness of the US strategic air command, it is unlikely these greatly troubled Moscow. Yet the prospect of over 140 V-bombs and a smaller number of Mirage 4s attacking every major city in the Western Soviet Union undoubtedly counted as a third and important factor in the power equation. The majesty of these graceful bombs will never be eclipsed.